So I recommend that you have a pen and paper ready because this is going to be an active uh, workshop on push period planning. I'm also gonna share with you at one point a Excel document that really helps you kind of figure out what a realistic should, could, and must do are. Um, we're not quite realistic, but once like if everything were to go well, this is what your could do could be. Um, and then helping you kind of figure out what your should do would be and what your must do would be based off of your could do number. Um, with that being said, I will send you the Excel document at the end of this call. That way you can use it as you'd like. Um, another thing to know is that we are in the works of creating an SC2 alliance amongst branch managers. Not quite sure what that looks like just yet. Um, we did it last year with uh, Vector East and it was branches that were going after 100K SC2 push. So we might lower that to like an 80K SC2 push. We're not quite sure just yet, but keep that in mind. If this is something you're interested in, please just um, DM me on, on Facebook and let me know and I'll put you in uh, for consideration. Given the fact that this is recorded and shared nationwide, uh, it could be fun to have people from other regions, Colton, I'm looking at you specifically, um, to join in on the alliance, but not quite sure what's all gonna look like. It'll be coming out in the next week, week and a half or so. So stay tuned. Um, as always, we have open office hours tomorrow morning from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. If you have any individual questions based on today's call, please bring them to office. I will have a Q&A session at the end of this, um, but obviously if you've been on office hours before, you know that I can give you a lot more time than like five minutes. Um, and then our next branch impact call. So we're moving away from once a week and we're doing once every two weeks. So if you go into the branch impact group, you will see that our next call is on July 9th. And that would be all about planning for a strong second half of the summer. So once again, talking about SC2, but also really diving into personal sales and diving into rallying around the team that's still with you. Uh, by July 9th, you will have pretty much finished recruiting. And so the team that you have at that point is the team that you're going to have. So we talk about strategies to kind of reignite passion in people um, but also to get people fired up about just finishing out the last month or so of summer, going after some big income goals and big experiential goals for themselves. So just make sure that you put that in your calendar. All right, so let's get started here. Like I said, I am going to be the only one speaking today, um, but I did want to start out with, you know, the first step to really anything that you do that's bigger than the norm. And it actually was inspired by the branch impact call from last week with Colton uh, regarding connecting to a purpose, you know, connecting to a deeper reason why. And I think we oftentimes talk about connecting to our whys in Vector, but we don't always do a great job of explaining what exactly that means or what is that process to connecting to our why. I've heard quotes like, if your why doesn't make you cry, then it's not a why. And I don't necessarily believe that it needs to be that altruistic, but it is important that you take some time to connect to the deeper purpose here. We always say that vector marketing is not about the knives. Uh, the knives are the vehicle, but there's so much more to vector than just selling Cutco. So I'm going to ask you guys four questions, and I will post these in the group as well, but I want to jot down some of the first things that come to your mind when I ask you these questions. So the first question, what is it about this push that is meaningful to you? Again, the question is, what is it about this push that is meaningful to you? All right, then the next question, what do you hope to gain throughout the 18 days of the push or 20 days of the push, depending on what region you're in. Some pushes are longer than others, but what do you hope to gain throughout the 18 day push or the 20 day push? The next question, what will you do to make this push as meaningful as possible for yourself and 
for others. What will you do to make this push as meaningful as possible for yourself and for others? And the final question, how will succeeding through the challenges over the 18 or 20 day push set you up for success over the next two years, over the next five years? How will succeeding through the challenges over the next 18 or 20 days, or the 18 or 20 days of the push, set you up for success over the next two years, over the next five years? So those are the four questions that I want you all to reflect on. And these questions are slightly more specific than what's your why, but through your answers of these questions, it helps you understand what your bigger purpose is here. Again, it's not about the knives. And I remember, and I'll always reference this, Nick Hankel brought up a really great point um, at the Midwest kickoff conference about how your choices that you make now at 18, 19, 20 years old will greatly set you up for success at 24, 25, 26 years old. And, you know, in Vector, we manufacture these pushes, right? Like there's no real reason why we have to have these pushes, but we create them because they are moments in our year where we can really put the pedal to the metal and go all out. And it leads up to a big celebration of, of champions, of, of sales, of recognition, of experience. But in reality, in the real world, there are many examples of pushes throughout your life. Um, it could be times where, you know, there's all of these different things happening in your workforce and you're going after a promotion, yet you're still trying to handle all the things that you, you're doing in your day-to-day -day job. And, you know, it's going to feel like a push. And so what we do here with Vector in the, in the sense of having pushes is setting you up for success in your life when things get really crazy. I myself feel like I'm in a push right now trying to juggle wedding planning, working with branches, and my podcast. And I can remember back to the times when I was in Vector and pushing where I was managing my schedule to a T. And I was running around, waking up at, at 6.30 in the morning, getting on a conference call by 7 a.m., making phone calls by 8 a.m. And from 8 to 10, I was grinding out making phone calls and getting people to say yes and people were saying no. And I was just having to overcome adversity in those moments. And then I was leading into a day full of action. And I can relate to that now when it comes to my to-do list with my wedding. You know, knowing that I have to make six or seven or eight, nine, ten calls for a certain videographer to find the right price. And so I know this is, you know, kind of a very specific example, but it's a reminder that there is a much bigger purpose here than just selling lots of Cutco. It's expanding your capacity for handling adversity. It's giving yourself, you know, a small window of time to accomplish a lot and to be able to do that is really valuable. It eliminates procrastination and rather it, it helps you maximize action. So answering these questions is so valuable. All right. So that's the first step here. It all comes down, it all starts with you. You are the leader, you are the one that sets the tone, you are the one that sets the example. So if you're not able to connect to your purpose, you can't assume or you can't, you can't even begin to ex expect your team to connect to their purpose. So remember, it starts with you connecting to your purpose. Robert, I know you just jumped on so you didn't hear the questions. I, I will be posting them in the Branch Impact page after this call and the recording obviously will be posted there as well. Okay, step number two, it's targeting an alliance. And so when you target an alliance, that is targeting a group of people in your team that are your A players, that are your elite team, that are, are your people who are bought in, who are excited, who are like, 
all right, I see this a little bit more than maybe the normal rep. You wanna ask yourself, who am I currently targeting? And I know some of you have one, two, three weeks left of recruiting, so some of those people might show up in the next week or so. You know, Dylan Foley is a great example of, of someone who started, like I think in the very beginning of July, went on to sell 50K and won a scholarship by the end of the summer. So your best people could still be out there. So if you don't have anybody that comes right to mind, focus on recruiting really sharp people over the next week or two weeks and, and target those kinds of people. But who are you currently targeting and when are you having the important conversation? If you don't have it in your schedule, it will not happen. You need to set aside 30, 45 minutes to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your alliance. They deserve that, especially if you're going to be asking them to basically give away two and a half weeks of their life to the team and to Cutco. So they deserve to have at least 45 minutes of your time to pour into them and to help them see the bigger picture, the bigger goal, and get them committed to a push. I want you to think about targeting your alliance as setting up a championship roster. So if you're looking at the push as playoffs, who do you want on your starting team? Again, if you're looking at the push as playoffs, who do you want on your starting team? And make sure that you have written down those names and then reached out to them to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And a key phrase you can use is, I see you as a key team player here. You know, what we're heading into, I know it might not make sense to you, but Cutco is a very competitive place, and I'm sure you felt that. What we're heading into is the playoffs. And I'm looking to set up my roster so I can have my heavy hitters on the team, on the, you know, on the playing field. And I see you as one of those heavy hitters and really pour into them and tell them how much you appreciate them and, and really leave them feeling good. And after you kind of poured into them and said, I see you as being part of this, this alliance, then you wanna make sure that you are doing your job to connect them to their purpose. So we know that within the playoffs, the push, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of promotions to be gained. There's a lot of recognition to be gained. There's a lot of challenges and growth to be gained. So it's important that you ask your individual Alliance members what excites you most. Is it the income over the next two and a half weeks? Is it getting a trophy on stage? Is it being highly considered for TLA? Is it just proving to yourself that you can do something like this? I mean, selling $20,000 in 18 days, that's, that's a big deal. And to be able to go into an interview and tell your interviewer that you had the ability to sell $20,000 of product in 18 days, that's really impressive. And I can tell from personal experience that having on my resume, um, I forget how exactly I worded it, but there is a bullet point on my resume that alludes to my $20,000 push during 2012. And how in 18 days, I was able to sell $20,000 and I was awarded top 20 in the, in the region. And I've had interviewers ask me specifically about that because that shows so many powerful, powerful skills. The ability to set a goal and to accomplish a goal, to be goal-oriented, to be action-oriented, to be able to face adversity, to be able to set a high goal and actually achieve it. And so it's important that you take the time to find out from each of your individuals what excites you most and then help them connect that to a longer-term purpose. I think it was Colton that said this, that long-term purpose creates short-term action. So when you can help them see that this push, it's not just about getting them to sell more Cutco. It's about helping them face true challenges that they will inevitably face in their life. This sets you up to be, you know, someone who can be quickly promoted. It sets you up to be someone who can take on multiple challenges. It sets you up to be someone who can be not just a sole contributor, but a team player. It sets you up to be an awesome young mother or father because 
newsflash, when you become one, you're going to be having to really push in a lot of areas of your life. And so helping your people understand that there's a bigger purpose here. Now, if you are someone who, this all sounds really great, but you're like, Shelby, I feel like I'm not gonna be able to really have those deep conversations. First off, have the confidence in yourself that you will be able to, but secondly, I do know that most of your divisions have some kind of script as to how to have that SC2 alliance conversation. So make sure that you're utilizing that if, you, if you're someone who feels like you need the script. And then in that conversation, you want to help them create a must-do goal, a should-do goal, and a could-do goal based on their schedule, leads, and current numbers. I find it so common amongst new branch managers that they get their personal hyped up. They do a great job of connecting the purpose to the action. Then they're like, so what's your goal? And the person's like, 20K, but they've only ever sold $1,500. Now, I'm not saying that 20K is not possible, but you need to take a realistic approach to helping them set up their goals. Take a look at their schedule. Are they going on vacation in the middle of the push? Do they have another job that they're working around? Set up a reasonable schedule that can get them excited, but can also tie into a reasonable goal. And that goal, that reasonable goal, is probably their should do. Now, they can have a big could do goal. I remember there was a guy who was on our SC2 Alliance during my very first summer whose goal was to sell $20,000, but he was leaving for Australia like 11 days into the push. And so he knew that he only had 11 days to sell 20K, whereas everybody else that was on the Alliance had 20 days. Now his should do was like 12 grand but he had, could do a 20 grand and he ended up selling $27,000 in 11 days. It was pretty incredible. So I'm not telling you to make their could do the realistic goal, but at least have somewhat of a realistic goal that is based around their schedule. That way they have a real plan of action and it's not like they're trying to fit in all of these things without having ever considered what is going on in their life. So once you help them create three different goals, their must do, should do, could do goals, reaffirm that you're going to be proud of them no matter which one they hit. Because if you have overachievers in your office, which probably all of you do, if they're only fixated on the could do goal, what tends to happen is they become very impatient and then they take themselves out of the running because they're like, well, what's the point? There's no way this is going to happen if by day five they're at $500 and their goal is 20,000. So reaffirming that at every single level, there's something in it for them and that you're going to be excited for them no matter what. Of course, we want you to go after the could do goal, but you have to hit the must do goal in order to even consider the could do goal. So let's focus first on the must do goal. How quickly can you get to the must do goal? And then we'll focus on the should do. And then we'll focus on the could do. Walk them through step by step. And then once you've gotten your numbers with them, Again, connect them to a deeper purpose. What about this goal excites you? Why will all of the hard work be worth it for you? How will you choose to succeed through the challenges that you'll face? And that final question is a really important question because we cannot, in good faith, pretend like everything's going to happen the way it's supposed to. We've all been through pushes. We all know that we have our best days and we have our worst days. And so I remember my hyping me up about the push by selling me on the challenges that I'm going to face. He was like, Shelby, do you realize like you're going to have your best days? Like you're going to, you're going to have days where you sell four or five thousand dollars, but you're also going to have days where you have eight demos booked. Seven of them are no-shows, and the final one, they get really hyped about a homemaker, and then they're like, mm, it's too expensive. And he kind of walked me through that challenge, and he helped me envision it, and then he helped me create a plan in the moment when everything was still feeling really good for me of how I would overcome it. And it almost created like a contingency plan for me. 
where when something like that did happen and I was in a really pissed off mood and I was starting to question whether or not my goal of $20,000 was even possible. And I called my manager. My manager said, Shelby, remember that conversation we had about the worst day? Listen, what you just experienced wasn't even as bad as what we talked about. But I remember when we talked about it, you said specifically that the way you were going to handle it was to come into the office and to make 50 phone calls. So what time can I expect you here? And so when you can create that contingency plan, it gives you leverage when someone's going through some crazy stuff to remind them of what they said in the beginning. And again, it helps you hold them to extreme accountability. So after you ask these three questions, what about this goal excites you? Why will all the hard work be worth it for you? And how will you choose to succeed in the challenges that you face? You then confirm their commitment. This is another area that I see a lot of branches make the mistake of not doing. You get all hyped up with them, you're asking the questions, you feel like the conversation's going really, really well. You yourself are feeling really confident in what you're saying and you're like, damn, if I was in their seat, I would 100% be fired up. And so you just make the assumption that they're fired up and that they're committed. But you have to actually ask the question. So based on all we just talked about, based on the plan that we just created, are you committed to hitting these goals for SC2? Are you committed to putting in the action that we outlined in your schedule? Are you committed to being part of this alliance? Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, great. And then you invite them to the alliance meeting. So all of these individual conversations need to be happening this week and early next week. I know many of your pushes start on like the 8th of July. Your alliance meeting should happen three or four days before that. And that's where you get the group together and you begin to build this team camaraderie, this team cohesion, because these are your A players. Let's get back to the playoffs. You know, I think about, um, I'm going to have to bring them up, the Eagles. They always talked about the reasons why they had such a successful playoff run back in 2017, which 2018 was because of the team cohesion. They all understood that they were in it to win. And so when you can bring back the alliance together, that's when you can create that team cohesion. And here's the thing, guys. I know you've already had the individual conversations with them, connecting the purpose. But going back to the questions I asked you in the beginning, these are the same questions you ask them. So what is it about this push that is meaningful to you? What do you hope to gain throughout the next 18 to 20 days? What will you do to make this push as meaningful as possible for yourself and for others? How will succeeding through challenges over the next 18 to 20 days set you up for success over the next two years, over the next five years? So the reason why you don't ask those questions in the individual setting is because you still need to give them time to get committed. And so you don't want to overwhelm them with these big questions because they need to really decide that they're going to be committed first before you go down that route. The reason why I started out this call with all of you and asking those questions is because you're in it. You're in it for the long run. I know that. You're running an office. You're on this call today. So I didn't have any fear of asking those questions now, but you have to get your people committed first before you begin to have them dream big. So now that you've had them at the Alliance team, they are there, they are ready to go, they are committed, that's when you ask those questions. And then here's what you do. The first thing you have them do is you have them journal the answers. You give them about five minutes for, per question. Then you have them pair off into groups of two. And you have them share the answers with one another. And then you open up the floor for group discussion. And again, what this allows you to do is to build team camaraderie because now everybody else is hearing people's thoughts about why it's meaningful for them. They're hearing how others are planning to hold one another accountable. That one question is really important. What will you do to make this push as meaningful as possible for yourself and others? It is insinuating that this is not just about you, it's about the team. So the reason why we do it in that method of individual first, 
group uh, partner share than group shares because there might be some people in your alliance who are somewhat introverted. And so this method helps the introverts come out of their shell and the extroverts kind of connect to their purpose. So that's the method of doing that. And then once they're in the alliance, and once they're in the alliance meeting and they've, they've gone through everything, it's time to go over the clear and concise, consistent standards. So you replicate the questions in the beginning, and again, they connect to purpose, they feel really good, they understand what they're doing this for. And then you cover the clear, concise, and consistent standards for the next 18 to 20 days. I would go as far as writing them down in a Word document and having your people sign that they have read and understand and they agree to abide by. Having on a Word document is really important because that way there's no room for error. You could be saying the clear and concise and consistent standards and the person in front of you could be writing it down, but sometimes people have selective hearing. So when you write them down in a Word document and you, you hand it out, it just makes it more official. So having clear, concise, and consistent standards is so incredibly important. Make sure that all of the Alliance events are in their calendars. Are you having morning phone jams every single morning? They need to be in their calendars. Are you having all day Sunday phone jams during the push? They need to be in their calendars. And then here's a really important part, and I kind of alluded to it before, but you have to talk in depth about handling adversity because we know that pushes are hard. And for 18 days to consistently show up every single day for an 18, 19, 20 year old who's never done this before is not necessarily a walk in the park. And so if you can take the time with your group to talk about the contingency methods of, hey guys, we're gonna have a group discussion now about the hard things that are gonna happen to you this, these next two and a half weeks. I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. You're on the A team for a reason, so I know you can take the truth. This is not gonna be a walk in the park. But you wouldn't be here if you wanted that. I know that each of you have individual goals, whether it's income or recognition or experience or growth. And that's what these 18 days are gonna be for you. So I want to talk right now about what it's gonna look like on day seven when you are nowhere near your goal. How are you going to respond? How do you want the team to respond? How do you want me to respond? and you have a group discussion about this, and you bring up crazy situations, and you always affirm, listen, you're gonna have your best days, but you're also gonna have your worst days. And so you wanna remind them that it's not all gonna be horrible. There's gonna be some really, really, really great moments as well. But the reason why you're bringing up the challenges is because you wanna create a plan to overcome them now, as opposed to trying to pull you out of the ground later when you're like, this is not working. It makes you think about um, the thing that Andrew Evans does. I'm sure you can find a video someplace, but he does this really fun chant with his team where it's like, day one of the push, and you go out and your first demo, you sell a homemaker. Your next demo, it's a no-show. And like, he, he does this ro roller coaster of, of good and bad things, and it gets people excited again to face the challenge and to overcome the challenge and to learn how to trust that by putting in the actions, everything will work out. Once you've covered all of that, you confirm commitment again on an individual basis. So before they leave the Alliance meeting, individually, two, three, four minutes, hey, I just want to once again confirm that you are committed to this Alliance, that I can count on you to be a part of this A team because Here's the reality, I'm gonna be part of it with you. And that's another good thing to remind yourself of is that you're in the boat with them and they need to know that. They need to know that you are getting right there with them and you're part of this too. You're gonna to be phoning alongside of them, you're gonna be battling alongside of them, you're gonna be facing challenges alongside of them, you're gonna be winning alongside of them. So they need to know that and it creates a whole different level of, of uh, camaraderie when they know you're doing this with them too. So again, confirm commitment again individually. All right, that's your alliance. Now you've got them set up, you're ready to go, and again, it's just holding them accountable to what they say they were going to do. Step four, so just to reiterate, steps one through three, step one is to connect to your own purpose. Step two is to target your alliance. 
Step three is to have the Alliance meeting. Step four is to not forget about the rest of your team. I know sometimes it's, it feels like you just want to focus on the top 20%, and of course that's majority of your time, right? That's 80% of your time for following the 80-20 rule, but there's still people on your team who can add value to your push. You know, I've heard, I don't remember who said this, but your push is not just made up of your alliance. It's made up of all the small orders that come in from your normal team. And so it's important that you check in with your team roster. I want to show you an Excel spreadsheet that I created for this exact purpose here. So I'm going to share that my screen with you here. Okay, can all of you see this? Just nod your head. Okay, perfect. So if I was to be running an office, it would be called the Philadelphia High Flyers. Play on words here. All right, so here is an example of how you can plan out your push with considering your alliance and also your rest of your team. So the first thing you want to focus on, obviously, is your, is your alliance right here. So that's this, this group right here. So you want to acknowledge what the current CPO is. It's just important that you know where they stand and what kind of challenges they might face at different levels of their, of their career. And then you have their push goal right here. So these are the goals that you've identified with them during the push meeting. Chances are, if they're on your alliance, they're going to have at least a minimum goal of 10K. That's something that your DVM will probably talk to you about. Here's an important aspect to just do for your own knowledge. Money earned if hits goal. And this is the money earned in the 18 days, not, not up until this point. So it obviously all depends on where they currently stand with their CPO, but I would take the time to do the math. Because what this allows you to do is to help them just see, like, at the very basic, what they can earn. And I remember my, my manager calling the SC2 push a money-making vacation. And he's like, I want you to tell your friends and family you're going on a money-making vacation because in the, next, in the next 18 days, if you hit your goal of $20,000, Shelby, you're going you're gonna to make ten grand in 18 days. And while the money wasn't the only thing for me, that was pretty damn cool to hear that I was going to make 10 grand in 18 days. Especially because up until that point, I had made 10 grand in the entire two and a half months I had been working there or something along those lines. So it's important that you do know these things because even if someone's not here for the money, connecting them to money is sometimes good. You know, I can't imagine somebody not getting excited about making five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars in 18 days. So at least knowing that for yourself is really important. Again, number of demos needed. This is something you do from a math standpoint based on their average order and their closing ratio. So just having this down here so you know what you're driving them towards from an action standpoint is really important. And again, just reminding yourself that they have all confirmed their commitment. So that's just how I would put together a, uh, the alliance tracker here. Next part is the rest of the team. So this is where you put together your roster of kind of your bench warmers in a way. Um, so you'll take their current CPO, and given the fact that they're not on the alliance, they're not looking to go big, what I just tend to do is just focus on their next promo. What is their next promo and how many sales does it take to get there? So I just wrote down here, sales needed to the next promo. And again, money earned if hits next promo. Again, just small things that you can use as leverage to get them excited. Again, number of demos needed. This would be based off of, again, their math. And then the level of commitment. So this you'll find out at the team meeting before the push begins. So you want to do this whole um, exercise before your alliance meeting, after your individual conversations with your alliance members but usually right before your team meeting, before the push begins. Because what you're gonna do at the team meeting is you're going to have individual conversations with the rest of your team. This is why you have the alliance meeting on either the, the morning of the team meeting or the, the day after the team meeting. So you're gonna have your individual, or like your group conversation with the alliance then. But during that team meeting, you wanna focus on the rest of your team and getting them excited about getting to their next promo and helping them plan out their next promo. Because you're not asking them to do anything crazy. It's just, hey, how cool would it be to get to your next promo? You know, again, what would that mean for you to get to the next promo? How could that help you with your resume? How could that, and insert, 
you know, triggering sentence based on what they want to get out of this job here. So once you have these numbers written down, then you put in your personal goal, right? So what are you looking to sell personally? Now, remember, this is really important for you to consider here. I typically say that your goal should be the highest amongst your alliance because you're the one that's leading by example. I and mean, if you think about the law of the lid, your alliance will only be as good as its leader. So if your alliance, if the top person in your alliance is going after 20K, you should be going after 20K, if not 25K. So put down your personal goal, do your math, know that it's probably going to take you, I don't know how many demos, 70 demos or whatever it might be. So then here comes your could do. So this is where you take, if everything were to go exactly as planned, if your alliance members were to hit their goals, if the rest of your team were to hit their, their next promo, and if you were to hit your personal goal, this is your could do number. So you just add up these, add up these, and add up this one, and that would be your could do number. What's great about this is it shows you the potential of your team. Now, if you see this number and you're like, well, I know I can do more than that, then you think about this team. You're like, all right, great. So Trent is at $2,300. He just started two and a half weeks ago. He's not part of the Alliance. He's got a vacation coming up. That's fine. For him to get to his next promo at 700 bucks, that could happen this week. So then you start to readjust, specifically cater to the actual person themselves. So if you want your push to be $100,000, you think, where can I create the additional 18,000? Can that come, most likely it's gonna have to come from here because this group already up here is doing a lot. So you're gonna have to find out how you can create another 18,000 within this group here. Does that make sense? Nod your head. Okay, cool. Then you take your should do and your must do goals. These are up to you. So I would say your must do goal would probably be something like maybe 75% of your personal goal. If everyone here hits their must do goal and if everyone here I mean, if these people hit their next promo, like the ones that only have like less than $1,000 to go, hits their next promo. Again, it's just kind of thinking critically about the capabilities of your team. So that would be your must do goal. And then your should do goal should be contingent upon you hitting your goal. So you should be considering that this is 100% part of your should do goal. And then maybe this is like 75% if they hit 75%, they hit their should do goals. And you know, these four people, do something and these two just jump off the face of the earth. So again, it's just kind of figuring out the numbers and taking some legitimate time to look at your team critically and think, okay, what are people's strengths? What's their commitment level? What, what's their really, really they can do? And, and put together those goals. And the reason why I bring this up is it's really important that you're looking at your team from an individual standpoint when you're creating a big team goal, because I see so often branch managers picking a number out of thin air. Let's say they pick, 50K to go after. They've got, excuse me, they've got 10 people on their team and they just think they need to drive all 10 to five grand. And that's how you get 50K. But that's not really fair to assume if somebody who's only at $1,200 and they've been here for three and a half months, it's not fair to put that assumption on them that they can do five grand. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you want to think critically about this and have intelligence behind the action and the plan. So I can send this to you after this call if you want to use it yourself. Um, but this is just, again, how you take a look at your team roster and really break it down for yourself. So that's step four. Take a look at your team. Don't forget about your, the rest of your team. Step five is to plan the Sunday fun day, all day phone jam. Some of you guys call this the mother of all phone jams. Others call it Sunday fun day. I mean, there's all different, you know, names for it. Bottom line is that that Sunday before SC2, everyone that's on your alliance should be committed to being in your office for 12 hours. Now, they're not going to be phoning for all 12 hours. You're obviously going to have some really fun things planned out. Maybe it's a um, Red Bull Olympics where you do all those fun drinking games in Olympic style fashion. So everyone comes in as an individual team, like as a, as a team, like maybe you put two and two together and you have all these different teams and you, you play fun games throughout the phone jam. That way they associate the all day Sunday fun day phone jam with actual fun, but you're also driving action because you're, 
you're doing it in short spurts, it's like sprints. All right, guys, in the next hour, we're going to hammer the phones. And then after that, we're going to do 30 minutes of Red Bull flip cup. All right, guys, next hour, we're going to hammer the phones. And after that, we're going to do an hour lunch where we're going to grill outside. And you just give incentives to take immediate action and maximize in those 30, 60, 90 minute windows with the promise of 30, 60, or 90 minutes of break. Something that I really love to do is the Mission 100, Mission 150, Mission 200 phone jam. So what this looks like for you is this will be probably amongst your alliance, but you can also have the rest of your team be part of this. So if your goal is to, like let's say your goal for SC2 is to do $60,000 for SC2, then you know that your first week probably should be around $30,000 of sales. Maybe 20 if you're like really believing in the whole like miracle of the second week. But I would say shoot for 30K, which means that you should be doing a mission 300 phone jam. And this is going to drive you throughout the week. So you start on Sunday, mission 300. On your whiteboard, you write 300, 299, 298. Delegate this task. Do not do this yourself. You don't have the time to do this. But you literally write out 300 in countdowns. Once everybody, as, as everyone's there, as they're booking demos, they are crossing off the numbers and they're putting their initials next to it. You have circled random numbers throughout the 300. Whoever books those random numbers gets a prize. You can choose whatever the prize is. This is meant to be done throughout the entire week if your goal is 300. Now, you can also do something that's really fun that's, that I tread lightly on giving this advice because I don't want you to spend extra money that you don't need to spend. But if you have the money, this is a really fun exercise to do as well. You can do a mission 100 for your Sunday fun day phone jam because if you want to do 10K in that Monday through um, Wednesday before your team meeting, it's probably a good idea. Or 150, so you can do the mission 100. And then for every demo booked, you, so you go to the bank beforehand, you get $100 in $1 bills. For every demo booked, you put a $1 bill in a bucket. And once they get to number one, you do a drawing where you ask Siri, pick a number between one and 100. Whoever booked that demo gets 100 bucks. So that's a really fun exercise to do for people too. But the point is, is that you want to make the Sunday fun day phone jam different than any other phone gym you've ever had. Games, balloon popping, um, guest speakers, stop bys, like whatever it is, like you just want to hype it up, like it is the craziest day ever. Now you also invite your other team in, but they don't have to come in for the entire 12 hours. They're just gonna come in for the afternoon. And you do like a team bonding exercise once they get in, and then you, you hit the phones. You really want to be careful about how you're managing your people's emotions during this one day because this day, if emotions are not managed properly, could take your alliance members out of the game. Now, obviously, you've done a good job of setting up the expectations that there's going to be challenges and you've done a good job of keeping that contingency plan when they're facing challenges. But the reality is you might have your top person have a really crappy phone jam. I was that top person that had a really crappy phone jam during that Sunday fun day phone during my first summer. I came in ready to go. My goal was 20K. I had 300 names and numbers. Like that's another big thing that you have to remember is that you have to have your people set up properly. Lots of leads, names and numbers, ready to go, phone charge, all those kinds of things. I came in with a directory. I had a book full of leads. Like I was like, there's just no way this is not gonna work for me. I did 300 phone calls and I booked three demos. And I was pissed. And I was like, what is going on? I'm the leader in this office. How is this happening to me? And my manager pulled me aside and was like, Shelby, this is going to be one of your hardest days. But what that means is going to be so many better days ahead of you. And I want you, and he actually had me leave. Like, so I was in, the, in at 8 a.m. And by 6 p.m., I had made 300 phone calls, booked three demos, and I was ticked off. And my manager was like, Shelby, I want you to go home. Like, you come back tomorrow morning, refresh. I don't want you to stay here any longer because obviously, like, today is not your day on the phones. I don't know if that was the best option, but you can choose to do that if you want. It works for me. I came back the next morning, and I did a morning phone jam, probably did 50 phone calls, and I booked 11 demos. 
So it's just sharing stories of people who go through crap, but they learn how to respond, not react. So again, really making sure you're managing your alliance's emotions throughout that phone jam because that is their first wave of real adversity. All right, step six is to recognize the crap out of everybody and get in the boat with them. So you need to be field training. You need to be phone jamming. Like when, when you are selling personally, you are setting the example. So when you're running phone jams, you are on the phone. You are showing them how it's really supposed to be done. And that's inspiring for them. For them to see you in the boat with them is inspiring because now all of a sudden you're no longer their manager, you're their peer. And that's fun. You're not competing with them. When you can do fun things like beat the boss day or beat the manager day. So you can do fun competitions. Hey guys, so today we're gonna do a beat the manager day. I got five demos. I know I'm gonna sell two grand today. Anyone who beats me will get free team night out. Again, like just getting in the boat with them, doing really fun things, consistently sharing updates, sharing shitty updates too, excuse my language, but things that don't work out well for you, share them so that people can see that it's not, it's not just them, like even the manager goes through adversity but getting them excited to be in the boat with them and then also like recognizing them for everything. The, the 18 days of the push need to be functioning on high cylinders in every single area, right? Like you need to be, just take me to the next level. They need to be feeling that this is like really special and like this is a different time. So that is how you really focus on working with your team. Now obviously there's a lot of extra things that you can do, I'm sure your DVMs have given you a lot of great tips, um, but I hope you've taken a lot of this and, and thought about some ways to implement all of these things. The final thing that I wanna talk about is your personal sales. I know a lot of you are probably like, oh my God, I cannot wait to get out there and sell. I agree with you. It is one of the most fun things to get out there as a branch manager and start selling because what you realize is that from teaching all summer how to sell, you have become so much better so much more confident. Your story is that much greater. I wish that you have your goal sharing sheet set up with all of your team on there and really hit home on your goals with your people. Like, you know, Mrs. Jones, like this summer I had the ability to run my own office and I have my own team. It's like the most incredible thing. And just getting Mrs. Jones tied into your team, sharing your team goal, but also your personal goals. Like just really, again, amping up your game in terms of your personal sales. Couple of things I do want to acknowledge just in case you might be in a similar boat as I was. When I was, um, this was actually more so for me when I was coming back for winter break, but it might be the same thing for you. When I came back for winter break, I felt like all of my old leads were stale. And I really worried about being able to push for the trip. Um, and I did something really dumb, I don't recommend doing this, but I ripped up all of my old leads and I threw them away. I remember my manager looking at me and being like, what, what did you just do? And I said, I've got one demo on my, my schedule. I'm fine. Don't recommend ripping up your leads, but I do recommend doing what I just did. I had one demo in my, in my schedule and I went in there and I really focused on referrals. That was my main focus. I did not care about the sale. I was there for the referrals because I knew that's what I needed. She bought a Santoku cheese knife, but she gave me 13 referrals. And we went through the heads up approach and she gave a heads up to all of them individually, not in a group text. You know, we did everything perfectly. Came back the next day or came back uh, that, that afternoon to the office and I started phoning. And I don't know whether it was the grace of God or because we did really well with the phone jam or with the heads up, but out of the 13, I think like eight or nine, or like maybe it was like 11 people said yes. And so what I would do when I would go into those next people's houses is that you know, I would start out the conversation talking about Mrs. Jones, the woman who referred them. And I would be so excited and I would be like, thank you so much for saying yes to me. This is actually the list that Mrs. Jones referred you off of. And I would pull out the list and I would show it to her. I would show her her name. I would show how I highlighted her name, like put like a little heart next to her name because I was excited to meet her. And I would just put it off to the side. And I would go through the demo and I would do all like the name dropping for the referrals. And I'd do all like, the little hints that you're supposed to do throughout the demo. And then when it got to the referral section, what I did was I would 
once again, grab the sheet that I put off to the side and I would say, all right, so I go through the referrals approach. Like, so this is a list that you came off of, like I showed you in the very beginning. I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a contest because I'm in this huge contest right now. And so I love contests and I love giving away free things. So if you can beat this list, I'll give you this vegetable peeler. And so I, I would pull out a new fresh list. I'd put it next to the original list. I'd put the vegetable peeler on top of the fresh list. And then what would happen was Mrs. the new Mrs. Jones would then be challenged to give me 14 names of all different people. Because how many times have we gone to see someone and gotten like the same referrals over and over again? So what I would do for those 11 demos that I booked from that initial list, I think that that tactic worked on like eight of them. And so now all of a sudden I have about a hundred new names and numbers to work with. And of course I continuously did that. I got to the point where there was one chain of referrals that was competing to get to like 25 names and numbers. And that's how I rebuilt my names and numbers list. So if you're a branch who feels like I'm not sure if I can sell personally because I think my leads are stale, all you need is one demo in your schedule to rebuild your entire leads list. Do not throw away your leads list, but know that you can rebuild your entire leads list off of one demo. The final thing that I want to say about personal sales. The reason why we give you 50% in July and August is to incentivize you to sell. Newsflash, we are a company that does take a look at our revenue. We do want you to sell. You signed up to be a branch manager throughout the month of August. So it is your job to sell Cutco and to manage your team. I see too many branch managers who look at August as their time to take off, and that is not doing your job. I understand that being a branch manager is tiring. And of course, August, maybe you can take a couple days off here and there because you are personally selling and it's not as crazy with your interviews, but your job is to sell. And there will be a lot of really exciting things coming your way that will incentivize you to sell even more. But just remember that it is your job to sell. All right. So that being said, I'll reiterate the, the six steps to to uh, you know, getting your team fired up about SC2. Step one is to connect to your own purpose. Step two is to target your alliance. Step three is to have your alliance meeting. Step four is to remember the rest of your team. Step five is to make the Sunday Fun Day phone jam unbelievably amazing. Step six is to get in the boat with your people and recognize the crap out of them and just make everything about the next 18 days. Amplify on the highest cylinders possible. And then finally, just a quick reminder about your own personal sales. There are so many ways to revitalize your leads list if you feel like you don't have enough. Um, but remember, your job is to sell and to lead by example. So that being said, do you have any questions regarding what I just shared with you that I can help out with right now? I have one. Perfect. So as far as like um, going back to like old leads, like how, do you have like a certain like way to approach them? Because obviously yes. like um, they haven't been people I've contacted since like last summer since I don't usually sell during the school year. Mm -hmm. So you can just say, you know, hi, Mrs. Joe. I, I don't honestly remember the, the whole phone approach, but you can just say, yeah, I sat down with your friend um, last summer and she, I mean, you can just be honest. Like I sat down with your friend last summer. I went off to school, so I didn't have the chance to reach out to you. But this summer I'm doing the same thing, working towards a scholarship. That'd be one approach. Um, another approach is just like, I sat down with your friend, Tammy. Um, a few months ago, I don't know, I think I would just ask your, your manager, but I would just go on the side of transparency and just say, yeah, I sat down with uh, Tammy last summer. She was so sweet. She recommended me to, to you, but I was going off to college, so I didn't have the time to call, but I'm, I'm back at it again this summer working towards the scholarships. So I thought I'd give you a call, and again, like, that's how I would probably approach it. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Did you feel like you gained value from this call? Okay, awesome. Great. Well, then what I will do is I will um, just, if you want me to share the Excel spreadsheet with you, just DM me on, uh, on uh, Facebook and I'll just send it over to you in, in Messenger, okay? Um, and then I will be posting this recording um, in a couple hours and we'll go from there. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Bye.